Madhava Kunja Bihari Janna bala ba giri bare dari Jayo gupi janna bala ba giri bare dari Jasodananabajanananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananananan
Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Shimad Bhagavad Gita as it is, chapter 12, text 5. Klesha Adikataras Sesham Avyakta Sakta Chetasam Avyakta Hi Katir Tukam Dehavad Bir Avapyate Klesha Dikataras Tesham Klesho dikataras tesham avyakta sakta chetasam avyakta sakta chetasam avyakta hi gatir dukkam avyakta hi gatir dukkam deha vad bir avapyate Dehavad beer of apute, Klesho de Kataras Tesham, Avyakta Sakta Chetasam, Avyakta Higatir Dukkam, Dehavad beer of apute. Klesha, trouble, adikatara, very much, tesham, of them. Oh, uh, did you announce the Swedish translations available in the earphones? Somebody do? Announce, announce. Everyone understands, huh? Good. Asakta attached. Chetasam of those whose minds. Of yakta toward the unmanifested. He certainly. Gati progress. Dukkam with trouble. Dehavadvi by the embodied of apyate is achieved. Could I have a little more volume, please, on this? Translation. For those whose minds are attached to the unmanifested, impersonal feature of the Supreme, advancement is very troublesome. To make progress in that discipline is always difficult for those who are embodied. Purport. The group of transcendentalists who follow the path of the inconceivable, unmanifested, impersonal feature of the Supreme Lord are called jnani yogis. And persons who are in full Krishna consciousness, engaged in devotional service to the Lord, are called bhakti yogis. Now here, the difference between jnana yoga and bhakti yoga is definitely expressed. The process of jnana yoga, although ultimately bringing one to the same goal, is very troublesome. Whereas the path of bhakti yoga, the process of being in direct service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, is easier and is natural for the embodied soul. The individual soul is embodied since time immemorial. It is very difficult for him to simply, theoretically understand that he is not the body. Therefore, the bhakti yoga accepts the bhakti yogi accepts the deity of Krishna as worshipable because there is some bodily conception fixed in the mind which can thus be applied. Of course, worship of the Supreme <laughs> knew that was too good to be true. Worship of the Supreme Personality of Godhead in his form within the temple 
is not idol worship. There is evidence in the Vedic literature that worship may be sagun and nirgun, of the supreme possessing or not possessing attributes. Oh. <laughs> this is going on and off. Is this controlled by Soren back there? Yeah? It's all going on and off if this is being controlled by you. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Now it's off. Hare Ram, Hare Ram. Hare Hare Hare. The worship of the deity in the temple is sagun worship, for the Lord is represented by material qualities. But the form of the Lord, though represented by material qualities, such as stone, wood, or oil paint, is not actually material. That is the absolute nature of the Supreme Lord. A crude example is given here. We may find some mailboxes on the street, and if we post our letters in those boxes, they will naturally go to their destination without difficulty. But any old box or an imitation which we may find somewhere, but which is not authorized by the post office, will not do the work. Similarly, God has an authorized representation in the deity form, which is called Archa Vigraha. This Archa Vigraha is an incarnation of the Supreme Lord. God will accept service through that form. The Lord is omnipotent, all-powerful. Therefore, by his incarnation as Archa Vigraha, he can accept the services of the devotee, just to make it convenient for the man in conditioned life. So for a devotee, there is no difficulty in approaching the Supreme immediately and directly. But for those who are following the impersonal way to spiritual realization, the path is difficult. They have to understand the unmanifested representation of the Supreme through such Vedic literatures as the Upanishads, and they have to learn the language, understand the non-perceptual feelings, and realize all these processes. This is not very easy for a common man. A person in Krishna consciousness, engaged in devotional service, simply by the guidance of the bona fide spiritual master, simply by offering regulative obeisances unto the deity, simply by hearing the glories of the Lord, and simply by eating the remnants of foodstuffs offered to the Lord, realizes the Supreme Personality of Godhead very easily. There is no doubt that the impersonalists are unnecessarily taking a troublesome path with the risk of not realizing the absolute truth at the ultimate end. But the personalist, without any risk, trouble, or difficulty, approaches the Supreme Personality directly. A similar passage appears in Srimad Bhagavatam. It is stated there that if one ultimately has to surrender unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the surrendering process is called bhakti, but instead takes the trouble to understand what is Brahman and what is not Brahman and spends his whole life in that way, the result is simply troublesome. Therefore, it is advised here that one should not take up this troublesome path of self-realization because there is uncertainty in the ultimate result. A living entity is eternally an individual soul, and if he wants to merge into the supreme whole, he may accomplish the realization of the eternal and knowledgeable aspects of his original nature, but the blissful portion is not realized. By the grace of some devotee, such a transcendentalist, highly learned in the process of jnana yoga, may come to the point of bhakti yoga or devotional service. At that time, long practice in impersonalism also becomes a source of trouble because he cannot give up the idea. Therefore, an embodied soul is always in difficulty with the unmanifest, both at the time of practice and at the time of realization. Every living soul is partially independent, and one should know for certain that this unmanifested realization is against the nature of his spiritual blissful self. One should not take up this process. For every individual living entity, the process of Krishna consciousness, which entails full engagement in devotional service, is the best way. 
one wants to ignore this devotional service, there is the danger of turning to atheism. Thus the process of centering attention on the unmanifested, the inconceivable, which is beyond the approach of the senses, as already explained in this verse, should never be encouraged at any time, especially in this age. It is not advised by Lord Krishna. Kvaishal vikatras tesham avyakta sakta chetasam avyakvihi gatir dukkam dehava bir vapyate For those whose minds are attached to the unmanifested, impersonal feature of the Supreme, advancement is very troublesome. To make progress in that discipline is always difficult for those who are embodied. So, we have discussed in this 12th chapter, so far, four verses. Today's verse being the fifth verse in this chapter. Wherein Krishna, the speaker of Bhagavad Gita, and the supreme authority on all yogic processes, being that he is the supreme personality of Godhead, is explaining about the differences between personal and impersonal worship of the Supreme and realization. He is doing this in answer to questions by Arjuna, who asked in the beginning of this chapter, which is better? Which is considered by you to be more perfect? those who worship you directly or those who are engaged in trying to realize you through the unmanifested or impersonal feature and that impersonal process, Brahman realization. Krishna explained that of the two, that person who is engaged in the transcendental service of He, that Supreme, He will very quickly get to this result. He is considered to be the topmost of the worshippers. But those who take up this impersonal system, they may also realize the Supreme, but after a long time, and in fact, in this verse, Krishna is again emphasizing the trouble that one will have to go through in order to attain the Supreme by the impersonal process. Klesha, trouble. And then, Adika, adika Tara means very much trouble. You have to face trouble when one is trying to realize the Supreme by the impersonal method. Yeah. He says, Krishna says, that the progress in this form of worship will be slow and troublesome. Why? Krishna states here, hmm? Gati dukkam dehavad bi avapite. The embodied soul, the embodied living entity, namely us, we who are living in a body, are going to have a very hard time dealing with a process which does not consider form or substance. We are living in this body. We are spirit souls who are captured within this bodily form by our own desires and previous actions under the law of karma. And we are now situated in this bodily form acting under our own desires. And we are embodied in a body with senses, senses, like the eyes want to see things. 
The ears want to hear things. The tongue wants to taste things. The touch sense wants to touch things. The living entity wants to be engaged in activities which he will enjoy. Being that he's embodied, it is very hard for him to give up all sense activity. For the living entity to say, now I will see no longer. Now I will hear no longer. Now I will speak no longer. Touch no longer. Taste no longer. Smell no longer. I give up all these activities. This is extremely difficult. The living entity has a very difficult time doing that because that he because he's living in this body, he has so many desires born of the body and its senses. So how can he just deny all of this? How can he just simply reject all of this? It's very troublesome even one is engaged in the yogic practice, even one is engaged with great austerities. But still, even he's trying hard, he can be dragged away by the senses at any moment. And the famous example of this is the way Menaka, the heavenly society lady, seduced Vishvami Chamuni who was engaged in meditation deep within the forest. You know, the yogis, they go deep within the forest to get away from all people. They don't want to be in contact with any person anywhere. They want to be freed from the distractions which could bring them away from their yogic practice. So, they go to secluded places as far away from civilization as they can, and they meditate there. So Vishwami Chamuni was meditating in the forest. He was a very special person because he was so powerful in his yogic practice, and he wanted to gain great, great power and potency by this practice. So King Indra, the king of heaven, became disturbed. How is it? that this Muni, Vishvamitra, is becoming so powerful, it is quite possible he might become so powerful that he's going to take over my position. Therefore, I had better stop him in his mystic power or his austerity before he takes over my position. So Indra, being the king of the heavenly planets, is also paranoid. <laughs> so he sent, everybody in the material world is, there are plenty of reasons in this material world to be paranoid. <laughs> because there are so many things here which can cause your destruction at any minute. <laughs> there are. One famous political sage once said, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you. <laughs> So, uh, even King Indra is not freed from this paranoia. So he felt, if Vishwamitra Muni is allowed to become so powerful, very soon I will be out of my position. So he took Menaka, which was, who was the best of his society girls, which means they're a little loose in their morals. Nice way of putting it. And he sent her down to the earth planet and said, just get that Vishramitra Muni. Don't let him finish his austerities. So he was meditating with eyes half closed in the mystic process. One has to close his eyes halfway and look at the tip of his nose. Something not so easy to do, at least for me. I have a very difficult time doing that, but... You're supposed to look at the tip of your nose with eyes half closed. Half closed because if they're fully open, then one can see too many things and be distracted. And if they're fully closed, one has a tendency to fall asleep. 
So better the eyes are half closed, so one doesn't fall asleep and he doesn't become distracted. And staring at the tip of the nose, because there's not too much trouble here. You can get into. So, at this time, Menaka came upon the scene with ankle bells. And when she stepped on the ground, her ankle bells made tinkle tinkle sound. And Vishwamitra Muni heard, because you can't stop the hearing process. Always the hearing process is going on. You can't half close your ears, for instance. So, he heard the ankle bells, and that made him very interested. What could be this bell in the middle of the forest? There's nobody here, and the animals do not make bells. And therefore, this must be something special. Because the ankle bell on the ankle of this beautiful girl had a special potency. And even though he was engaged in this mystic process of meditation, he opened his eye a little bit to see what was the sound, where was it coming from. And then he saw Menaka. And she was blazing hot, being sent for a very specific mission, and he was finished. And from that, Shakuntala was born, one very famous lady, who was abandoned by both father and mother right after she was born. Still, he did not stop his meditation. He cursed himself, beat himself in, uh, mentally, what a rascal he was, and went on again with the meditative process. But the point here is that if one is engaged in this process whereby one is trying to push away or negate all sensual perception, it's very difficult, very troublesome. And one can fall down from that process. Therefore, Krishna says, Klesho dikataras tesham. It's a very difficult process. Uh, for those who are embodied, there is, after all, every possibility that the senses will become attracted again to their objects. After all, this is the nature of senses. The nature of the sense is to be attracted to some object because that is the nature of a body. It is like chemicals. The nature of some chemicals is to mix as soon as they come in connection with each other. If you take camphor, camphor, menthol, and thymol, even you have them in separate bags, if they're in the same main bag, somehow or another they start melting. Just by the chemistry of it. As soon as these three chemicals are in contact with each other, they produce a liquid. And you can't stop that. Uh, unless you keep them all in plastic containers so that there's no chemical combination. They will always produce a liquid. So we find that when the proper uh, situation is created by which the chemical combination of the sense and the sense object is manifest, then automatically the sense will be attracted to its object and the living entity has the possibility of falling victim to the senses. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita that if one's mind becomes fixed even on one sense, it can drag away the mind of one who is endeavoring to control it. Indeed, in the scripture it says, Matrasvasa, Matrasvasa, Dhichava, Navivekta, Sanobhaved, Balavan, Indriya, Gram, Ho, Vidvam, Sam, Apikashati. One should not even sit closely with his mother or even sister 
on the same seat because there's possibility of becoming agitated. You may say, no, this is only for low class men have sex with their sister or mother. Low class only, no. Balavani diagrama vidvamsa apikarsati. Even a learned person could fall victim like this. Because Balavan in Giagramo, the senses are very strong. As soon as one comes in contact with the object of his senses, the possibility is automatically there to fall down into the material existence. It is not that everyone will take the possibility, but the possibility is there. And the more the possibility is there, the more the possibility to fall down is there. Therefore, in the yogic practice, it's dangerous because there'll always be some sensual object somewhere which will jag one away from his intense attachment or his intense endeavor in the yogic process. Therefore, Krishna says, it is certainly a risky proposition to engage in this practice of impersonal form of the yogic process. It's a risky proposition because anybody can fall down from that process at any time. And history has many examples of such fall downs. Some of them famous, some of them not so famous. But those who are engaged in the bhakti process, they have a much easier time of in conquering over the difficulties of the sensual attractions because the senses are already engaged in some positive process. Therefore, this yogic process of bhakti yoga is actually more powerful because it enables one to engage in a way which is more natural. It is natural for us to engage with our senses. And it is unnatural for us to engage by negation of the senses. To engage by negating the senses is very difficult because one has to continuously fight the senses. All the time fighting with senses. Because the eye wants to see, the ear wants to hear, and every time the eye wants to see something, you say, no, no, don't, no, no. And what is the only way to avoid it? Don't look. The ear wants to hear. How do you stop it? Very difficult. The tongue wants to taste. How do you stop it? Therefore, the yogis, they go into trance. And in that trance condition, they do not engage themselves in sensual activities. Yam, niyam, asam, panayam, prachahara. Then dharna, dhyana, samadhi, the eightfold mystic process. Yam and niyam, activities which are to be accepted and activities which are to be rejected. Ah, asan, sitting in various yogic postures according to the best methods for attaining uh, a peacefulness of mind. And when the mind is about to come under control, pranayam, for bringing it in, into the state of trance after gradually subduing it from all of its passionate activities, and prachahara, withdraw the senses from their objects. Prachahara means take all senses and gradually pull in all of the sensual perceptions, just like a tor tortoise pulls in his head within his shell. Or a man reels in something with the fishing rod. So, pulling in Withdrawing, disengaging, it is called. Disengaging the I from form. 
means making a separation between the sense of sight and its form, objects, form. Therefore, one has to disengage the two. And it becomes situated within the intelligence, gradually. First within the mind, then within the intelligence. This is called prachahara, dharna, when all of that is absorbed up into the platform of intelligence. This is very difficult. Because who can give up the objects of the senses like that? Who can even figure out how to do it nowadays? Well, who can give them up? The eye, would we have to tell the eye, no more seeing. No more. Not that we just don't look for a couple of days and then look like any, no. No more. Finished with sight. Very difficult. Finished with sound. Finished with touch. Finished with taste. Finished with aroma. Finished. Whole life finished. Therefore, in the Himalaya mountains, they lower people into a cave on a sheer face of a cliff with a rope from the top, and that is it. Wave goodbye, and no more. He stays there in mystic meditation until he achieves perfection. And there's no way out. Once you go in those cave holes, that's it, finished. You're never going to come out again. No way to climb up. No way to climb down. Nobody around to yell to, to throw you another rope. Very difficult process. All right, that's that's a very, very complicated, fanatical kind of a process. All right, so then you're in the forest. But you have to do the same thing. Except in the forest, you can walk back home when you fail. In the cave, in the mountain, you can't get out once you're in. But in the forest, you can walk back home if you fail. Or even if you succeed. Dhruva Maharaj, he succeeded. And he also walked back home. So, the point is that in order to attain success in that discipline of negation of the senses, or that discipline of always making distinction between this is Brahman, this is not Brahman, one will have a very difficult time of it all the time, saying this is Brahman, this is not Brahman, this is Brahman, this is not Brahman, making a distinction like this, neti, neti, neti. Not this, not this, not this, not this. Therefore, Krishna advises, why take so much trouble to undergo this heavy austerity of this mystic process which simply brings one to a point which you can quickly and easily get to by the bhakti process. Prabhupada once explained it as follows. These other yogic processes are like taking the goldsmith's hammer and banging. You can gradually, gradually make some advancement in breaking through the rock. But the bhakti process is like the big sledgehammer. Whomp! just smashed upon that rock and cracking it very quickly. So one can, if he wants, take the little hammer and go tick, 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 tick. Or he can take the blitz, big sledgehammer and just whomp. We are very much impatient in that regard. We want quick result. Quick means one lifetime. Or one lifetime that we can live after all, the mystic yogis have to extend the duration of their life many hundreds of years. Otherwise, they're not able to complete their yogic practice. The first thing you have to do by the pranayama is reduce the breathing process so that you can live for hundreds of years. Now, this, the devotee, first of all, does not want to live for hundreds of years. That's too much. He has a hard enough time with the 80 or whatever he's allotted in this lifetime. We want to go back to Krishna. 
So we are not interested in extending the duration of life. Quite the contrary. We want to finish it off as fast as possible. Yeah. Therefore, we take the quick process. Quick process is also sure process. Because the longer period of time there is between the performance of bhakti and the success, or the performance of yoga and the success, the more chance there is of being diverted in that yogic practice. If I'm taking a long time in my process, that means there's more time for maya, the external energy, the, excuse me, illusory energy of the Lord to capture me and deviate me in my practice of the yoga process. Maya is very alert to make sure that you don't follow the yogic process. Maya is always trying to find so many tricks to stop us in our practice of yoga. And when one is trying to practice in this uh, mystical process or jnana process, he's not very much engaged there is some parts of his existence which are not at all engaged, like the senses or the mind. Therefore, when not engaged, maya can come and steal the living entity away. After all, that's the nature of the mind. It can very quickly degrade us. We also hear how the mind, an idle mind is a devil's workshop. An idle mind. A mind which is not engaged can cause havoc upon the conditioned soul. Havoc. The mind which is not engaged can make a lot of trouble for us. And we may have seen that in the cases of our own minds. When they don't have any sufficiently good engagement, the mind will just speculate like anything. Ooh, And by that speculation, we can get in a lot of trouble. We've also seen how the mind can degrade one. But one should not degrade himself with his mind. He should elevate himself by the mind. Elevation of the mind or elevation by the mind is pro possible in a proper process of yogic practice. And degradation of one by the mind is possible when one is in maya, in the material world. Possible? is definitely, definitely happening. One who is not engaged in a positive process of yogic practice will be degraded by that same mind because the mind's function is to continually accept so many influences from the senses and to engage us in satisfying our sensual desires while glorifying us all the time about how nicely we are doing it. The mind can be considered to be like a cheater because the mind actually is engaging in its own service first. The mind does not care. The mind does not care about us. Factually, it can be a great enemy to us if we are not careful. And then again, the mind can be a very good friend. A trained mind is a good friend. An untrained mind can be like an enemy. A trained mind is one which knows what is best to think about, what is best to engage in, and an untrained mind always uh, reaches for sense gratification, sense desires and always tries to drag us into a very deep pit of material enjoyment. Therefore, training is required. After all, the living entity in a raw condition, untrained condition, is in danger in the material world. He's in danger because 
every part of the material nature is potent to drag him away from his spiritual practice. Every portion of this nature is sufficient to drag us away, especially when there's some very attractive feature of this material world. Because we wish to be attracted by the material world, because actually we are filled with all kinds of desires to enjoy the material world, so the material nature has all possibility to drag us away by showing to us the alluring features, showing to us those features of the material existence which are very nice and which can attract our mind and senses. And when our mind and senses are attracted to any feature of this material existence, then our desire for endeavoring in spiritual life becomes reduced. In fact, it is a proportional relationship. Bhakti parasanu bhavo viraktir anyatrucha. Let us say that you are 60% engaged in spiritual service. That means 40% attached to maya. 30% engaged in service, 70% attached to maya. 90% engaged in service, 10% 10, 10 engaged in maya. It is a definite relationship between how much one is attached to and engaged in his material activities of the senses and how much he can be absorbed in his spiritual activities of transcendence. There's a direct relationship here. And when one is engaged in some mystic process, as we describe with uh, Vishamitra and the mystic yogic process, it is possible that that personality is not sufficiently motivated or sufficiently matured in his mystic practice that whatever percentage left there is does not or is incapable of dragging him away. It is possible that he can be deviated in his practice because he's immature, he's not very fixed in his devotional attitude or devotional service. And what to speak of one who's engaged in the impersonal process? He, because the process itself does not engage all the senses, can be dragged away as soon as a sense fixes on its object. He can be immediately lost. And the whole mystic process can be given up. There are examples of those who've given up the whole process simply because they became engaged in some uh, sense desire. The best example of this is Ajamil. Ajamil was, at his birth, a great brahmana. He was born in a high-class brahmin family, and he was very devoted to all of the principles of uh, advancement in spiritual life. He would collect all of the paraphernalia for advancement. He would collect all of the required uh, necessary uh, um, uh, plates and valuables and brahmanas and so many things. He would bring them all there just so his parents, his father could make a nice sacrifice and offering and everything was perfect. But one day, while he was going out and collecting these paraphernalia, he saw a man and woman embracing on the side of the road in lusty embraces. And he became attracted by that. But he tried to conquer that by controlling his senses, by his intelligence, and remembering the philosophy, Krishna consciousness. But the mind wouldn't forget this image. His mind would not forget this image. And he became victimized by lusty desires. He could no longer control himself. He could no longer control his mind. And he began to fall down from the platform of devotional service just by seeing. Yeah. Of course, he was not engaged in devotional service fully. He was acting as a brahmana, 
in the spiritual category. He wanted to perform some sacrifices with his father. And he fell down again. He fell down and searched out that same woman and he married her. So we find that one can be dragged away by even one sense, which is very, which is fixing on its object. If one sense fixes on its object, we can be dragged away. If just the eye fixes on some sense object, we can be dragged away from our practice. Or the ear, or whatever. It is possible. Therefore, one has to engage in a process which engages all these senses. Yeah. Therefore, the process of bhakti engages the senses, for instance. We use the tongue in the process of chanting. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. We use the ear in the process of hearing. We use the eyes in the process of reading these transcendental literatures or seeing the beautiful form of the Lord in the temple. Hare Krishna. <laughs> Lost all the volume again. Hello, hello. Right. And we engage the nose in smelling the flowers or the incense offered to the deity. We engage the tongue in tasting Krishna prasadam, foodstuffs offered to Krishna. So we engage all the senses. We engage the body in working for Krishna, doing various activities. So we engage all the senses and thus there is a safety margin. We are not so quickly deviated simply by some sense desire as a mystic yogi would be. After all, we are busy relating with the material world so that in one sense makes trouble but in another sense also gives some strength. If you are practicing the process of negation of the senses and you are sitting in a forest for 500 years and after 500 years of no sensual activity a heavenly society girl walks by you immediately one becomes flooded with desire because of the eye having so long been devoid of any object all of a sudden becomes flooded with a huge sense object then one falls down very quickly whereas one who has been interacting with the material world can gradually develop detachment through that interaction because he is not so much uh, affected because it is an everyday thing. Every day one sees various objects of the senses. And that also, to a certain extent, gives one a little bit of strength as compared to that yogi who tries to avoid completely all sense objects for hundreds of years. Yeah. So, in Krishna consciousness, these senses are not starving for their objects. Therefore, one is able to more easily control these senses. When these senses are starving, then it is very difficult. Just like if you don't eat and you get very hungry and one is extremely eager to eat, the mind thinks about it continuously, non-stop, and never gives up the thought of eating. Always is thinking, eating, 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 and driving you to eat until you get something to eat. The senses are so strong and impetuous like this. They can drive even a man of discrimination to a sinful activity which he doesn't ordinarily wish to, wish to do. So, we find that there are many ways to act. But that way which engages all the senses and the mind and the intelligence in the service of the Supreme is the best way. And those ways of action which leave the senses in a, either a suspended state or an unengaged state are dangerous because at any moment one can fall down 
due to over-desire or too much desire of a particular sense. Therefore, the personal list, because he is engaged in actual direct service to the Supreme in the form of the deity, with his senses, is in a safer condition than the impersonalist. And he has a much easier time of it to surrender. Now that is not to say that it is easy. The process is easy, but there's also some difficulty there. There's always austerities in the performance of spiritual life. We don't want to say there's no austerity. There's some austerity. Not too much great austerity. After all, the mystic yogis, they have to go through incredible austerities. One austerity is to sit in a ring of fire in a blazing hot day. Or in the freezing cold, to sit in a freezing cold river in the middle of the winter with water up to the neck. So the yogis, they have a lot of austerities. What to speak of the standard bed of nails or sitting in a thorn bush or something like this. They have a lot of austerities that they take upon themselves. Devotees do not take artificially austerity because there's enough austerity in this world without having to search, without having to search it out artificially. It comes to you. When one is engaged in the process of bhakti, automatically there will be austerities. Yeah? One of the biggest austerities in the world is having to deal with people. We find so many persons have so much trouble dealing with people in this way. This is the most difficult thing of all. You can deal with anything. It's easier. You can even deal with tigers easier than dealing with people. <laughs> because everybody's got their own idea of things and they want to do things in their way. It's, it's so difficult. <laughs> but that is also austerity how to do things in a nice way within a social framework. That is also austerity. It is also austerity of the, ma of the mouth, the tongue, to use it only to chant the Vedic knowledge or the Hare Krishna mantra or to eat Krishna prasadam. That is austerity of the tongue. That's not very big austerity from the point of view if you compare it to sitting in the cold water in a freezing cold day. But it's austerity nonetheless. Because the tongue wants to say so many things. So much it's called prajalpa. Prabhupada once compared it to the croaking of the frog informing the snake exactly where he is so the snake can come and eat him. The frogs, they like to croak in order to make their own sound. They like to hear themselves croaking. Just, I don't know why, frogs like to croak. And <laughs> snakes like to eat frogs. So the snake calls the frog, come and eat me, come and eat me. <laughs> so similarly, we may be very much engaged in the talking process, Pujapa it's called, talking. But if we're talking about maya or material things, then we are calling the snake of maya to come and grab us. But if one is only talking about spiritual affairs, then he will be able to avoid that snake of maya. That's an austerity. It's like, it's austerity. We go through some austerities of the body, utilizing the body in service to Krishna and offering the results of that to Krishna. That's austerity because the mind and the material world wishes that we only engage in its service or the service of our senses. So austerity is there to act on behalf of Krishna, but it is not that big austerity. It is austerity which is uh, very sufficient to bring us to a spiritual platform. So some austerity may be there, but result is also there, immediate result. And part of that may be realized by realizing the form of Krishna in the temple where we worship Krishna. Some may say, well, what are these forms of Krishna? They are nothing but idols, statues. But there is a difference here. 
between these forms of Krishna and some statue. Some statue may be there and maybe in a museum somewhere uh, or something like that. But when the deity of the Lord is there and is an uh, authorized form of the Lord, that form of the Lord will reciprocate with the worshippers. Uh, Krishna will personally reciprocate with the worshippers due to the installation process. We call Krishna and request him to kindly accept this form so that we may worship him because we have eyes and therefore we'd like to see Krishna because in this material body we cannot see the spirit directly, we cannot see Krishna directly. Therefore we would like to have some possibility of worshiping Krishna even though we cannot directly see him in the spiritual form. So Krishna so mercifully accepts the material form to accept our worship. Krishna accepts our worship and allows us to serve him nicely. So the difference between the form of the Lord and a statue is that difference which is there between the authorized post box and some shoe box, for instance. If I have a letter and I post it in my shoe box, it's also a box. But my letter is not going to get anywhere. If I post my letter in the mailbox that the post has put there, and it's one of these bona fide boxes, you know, with the little white paper saying so many things. You have this on the box, yeah? A bona fide box, you know, it says the mail will be picked up this time, this time. So your mail will get there because it's a bona fide box. The proper authority has authorized this box. And thus, the activity of offering the letter to the box will get the result. But if you just take any box, even an imitation box, it may look exactly like the post box. Somebody may be cheating because he wants to steal money or something. So he gets another box and makes it exactly like the post box and puts it outside his door. Then people come and they put envelopes with money in it or whatever. Then he at night sits home and... <laughs> so it may look exactly like the box. But if it's not authorized by the post, the mail does not go to its proper destination. So someone may have some form of God, even, or some imitation like that, but it is not an authorized form. It even looks pretty close, but it's not authorized form. Then the result of the worship will not be achieved. It must be an authorized form and an authorized process, proper way. Then the result will be there for those who worship the Supreme. So worshiping the Lord according to the proper methodology is also an austerity. But one which brings very nice results when one takes it up. Actually, Krishna conscious austerities are not very severe. But they bring such a sweet result to the performer of these austerities. Sweet result. A result which is very much desired by everybody. Everybody wants to taste this nectar of love of God in. We all want to taste it. Maybe some understand why or what it is, and maybe others don't understand. But the basic desire of every living entity is to taste the nectar of pure love. The problem is that we generally don't do that because we are very much interested in chasing the pure lust of this material world. Although we think that will give us real satisfaction, that is the real love, it's not so. It is simply the contact of the body with its senses. And such pleasures are limited and temporary. Therefore, the wise man does not like to delight in them, knowing perfectly well that such pleasures have a beginning and an end. And that which has a beginning and an end will never be satisfying to the conditioned soul. 
because he will always become entangled within the network of his own desires. Therefore, Krishna recommends the personal process of worshipping the Lord, whereby one will use his senses in the service of the master of the senses, Krishna, who is called Rishikesh. Sarupadi venir muktam tatpart vena nirmalam Rishikesha Rishikena sevanam bhakti ruchite. Bhakti is defined as that process by which one uses his senses in the service of the master of the senses. And the result is he becomes purified of all bodily designations of life, which are the source of the suffering conditions that the living entity must face in this material world. Each and every one of us must face a suffering condition because of the nature of the body. But if that suffering condition is mitigated by the process of chanting, by the process of bhakti yoga, then he no longer has to be troubled by these conditions. The bhakti process means you engage in devotional service, free oneself from all of the identifications with the material body and mind, and at the end go back home, back, home, back to Godhead, spiritual world. If one is engaging in the material world, he becomes filled with designations. I'm a this, I'm a that. And each of these designations becomes the cause of trouble. Everybody has designation, and that designation causes him trouble. This material world is a world of names. Names only. Continuously changing, and continuously causing friction. We label something something, and then it gives us trouble. Huh? It's like we deal with people sometimes like that. We give them a label. And then we start to deal with them as if they were a label. Yeah? It's like we used to uh, find, some people used to do with us, Hare Krishna devotees. They would say, oh, you're just madmen. Look at the way you're dressed. And then because that label was there, then they would be busy dealing with us like we were madmen. And they would feel very satisfied because they had us in some little box which they liked very much. And then they would deal with us in this way. And people, they get into a lot of trouble like that, all these designations. Just put a name on something and then deal with it that way. We have a saying in English, give the dog a bad name and hang him. You just designate somebody a dog with a bad name and then you make a party, get a party together and hang him. So you can do like this, just by designation, just by names, just by words. You can make that which is good bad or that which is bad good just by words and change the one's whole perception of things. Just label something which is terrible as very good and everybody thinks, yes, it's very good. Just like nuclear reactors for making electricity. They're very good, aren't they? Everybody thinks, yes, it's very good. Until they blow up, then they're very bad. Designations. We designate this good. We designate this bad. We're designating ourselves in different ways. Yeah. I'm man. That's good. Or I'm uh, American. That's good. Good for what? I'm not sure. But anyway. <laughs> or I'm old. That's bad. Yeah. Or I'm fat. That's also bad. There so many designations. You can just pick out so many designations. Bodily designations. And then we say, this is good, this is bad. Therefore, uh, Bhadra Bhadra Gyan Subhamano Dharm. Uh, actually, all this concept, this is good, this is bad, is all mental conception. All of these various designations are also mental conception. Because the spirit soul is none of these things. He's not fat. He's not thin, he's not man, he's not woman, he's not black, he's not white. Neither is he Hindu or Christian or Muslim or Jew. The spirit soul is transcendental. Asango, Hyam, Purusha, he has no contact with these material designations. 
He's a pure, transcendental, spiritual living entity, embodied soul. And when he takes up the process of Krishna consciousness under a bona fide, authorized method, he can quickly relieve himself of all of these painful conditions arising from the bodily designations of life. So therefore, we recommend to all of you to take up this process nicely, become freed from all of these designations, these names, these forms which are born of maya, and take up that real designation, I am Krishna's eternal servant. Jivar Swarupoy Krishnair Nichadas. I am the eternal servant of the Supreme. And when I take up that process under the direction of Krishna, as Krishna's eternal servant, I will realize my very blissful position again. Even you take up this impersonal process, you can only get to the point of eternality and perhaps knowledge. But the blissful potency of the Lord is only perceived through the bhakti process. One gets full realization, sat chit ananda vigraha. So kindly engage in this process very nicely, become perfected, go back to Godhead, and be blissful. Are there any questions, perhaps, from our guests? Yes. Yes, his childhood pastimes also only take place here, within the material world. Your mother showed us there, but Krishna's already grown up. But she's always keeping within her heart the form of Krishna as baby Krishna. Mother Yashoda, she travels with Krishna wherever he goes in his transcendental roadshow. There in the spiritual world, the idea of Krishna's childhood pastimes is always there, but they are not manifest directly in that sense when you speak of the unmanifest. But Yashoda, Mata, and Nandamaraj, they go with Krishna wherever he goes, as Devaki and Vasudeva, they are coming from the platform of the material world. But Yashoda and Nandamaraj, they are the eternal servitors of the Lord in this way. And Krishna only performs those childhood pastimes here in this material world. Devotees can ask too. Yes. Yes. Certainly. He can, theoretically. He's very sincere afterwards, very repentant. And if Krishna accepts him, why not? It's probably easier to understand God than he, and then understanding how you move your own hand. <laughs> because this is all of the various intricacies of understanding the whole network of the creation of the body. But as far as understanding the Supreme, that's all written there in the Vedic literature. And by engaging and chanting Hare Krishna, you get realization of God, not realization of hand. Your power of understanding is definitely lacking. Therefore, the Veda fulfills or fills up that lacking portion with knowledge. And when you chant Hare Krishna and engage in Krishna's service, you get knowledge from within. 
پیشم صده یک دنم بطه تم پیتی پور بکم ده دامی بوری اگم تم یه اینم هم بگویم دیتر Those who are always worshipping Krishna in love and devoted to him Krishna from within the heart gives them knowledge by which they can come to him Nishani vanu kampatam aham agyanam tam dama nashayami atma bhavasto gyana dipena vashata From within I destroy all of the darkness of ignorance with the shining lamp of knowledge. So Krishna says, I give you that knowledge from within. After all, he's the source of understanding. I give you the remembrance, knowledge, forgetfulness. So Krishna will also give to his devotee that knowledge by which he requires, that knowledge which he requires to come to him. So knowledge of how your hand is working is not required. Everybody out there all clear? No, uh oh. <laughs> Better ask a question. But uh, you mean karma yoga action in Krishna consciousness? Karma yoga can be. Well, first of all, there's pure karma, just action. For instance, in fruitive activity where one may act in such a way as to go to heavenly planets or get some good results like this. This is not discussed in Bhagavad Gita. Karma Yoga, that is discussed in Bhagavad Gita, is meant for the living entity to engage in Krishna's service and take the result of his actions and offer them to Krishna. For instance, if somebody goes outside and works and then comes to the temple and donates the results of his work, then his work has become karma yoga. Because he's taking the results of his work and offering them to Krishna. So his work has become karma yoga. In other words, he may not be doing it in pure devotion. Or it may be an activity which is not in and of itself devotional service. But when the result is offered to Krishna, then that's karma yoga. That's also purifying. That's good. But even better is to do one's work, which is according to Krishna's instruction, with love and devotion. Then that's bhakti. That's even better. Is that all right? <laughs> all right, Hare Krishna.